So what you're looking at here is actually a 2.4 billion year old quarry. This is in Western Australia in the Hammersley Formation. And this is known as a banded iron formation. And they're extremely important today because they constitute the world's largest source of iron ore. But they also record a remarkable history of the evolution of metabolism. Now how can this be? How do these massive rock quarries tell us anything about microbial life? Well, when you think about what they actually constitute, they are made up of iron minerals as well as other minerals, um, cherts, which is a type of silicon oxide, intermixed with these iron species. But for now, let's just focus on the iron. So how did this iron get into this big deposit that you see here? Well, it began a long time ago in ancient seas in the form of ferrous iron. That's called iron II. And then some process, which I'll get to in just a minute, oxidized this ferrous iron to ferric iron. And at that point, it could react with constituents in the water, such as hydroxyl species, to form iron minerals, such as this one, ferric oxyhydroxide, rust. And over time, this mineral transformed and changed into different types of minerals, became compacted and mingled with others, and wound up in these rocks that we today know as banded iron formations. But this initial step here is the critical one in terms of giving us some insight into microbial activities on the ancient Earth. And let's think about two scenarios where microorganisms might have been involved. The first scenario is one where a very primitive type of photosynthetic organism, well I should say primitive in quotes because actually this metabolism is remarkably sophisticated. Nonetheless, this is primitive in the sense that it's a type of photosynthesis that does not generate oxygen. Rather, it's called anoxygenic, meaning there is an electron donor, in this case ferrous iron, that is oxidized to ferric iron, and that powers the reduction of inorganic carbon, CO2, to biomass. And you can see this is a very dramatic metabolism when it occurs, because all you need is light, microorganisms, and ferrous iron, and a few other things to help them get going, but those are the really three most important ones, in a bottle here with, a, as I said, a few nutrients added so that they can uh, do their thing. And when light is uh, shined on this bottle, these organisms very rapidly are able to oxidize the iron and they produce rust, and you can see the rusty color here in this bottle. And this rust is exactly the type of iron that is the predecessor of the minerals that constitute these banded iron formations. Now in the middle, you see these organisms growing on a different electron donor, and I'll get to what I mean by an electron donor and an electron acceptor later in this lecture. And in this case, they're utilizing hydrogen as an electron donor. And the pink color you see is due to photosynthetic pigments in their membranes that enable them to harvest light and grow in this way. So this scenario, as I said, um, is one that is catalyzed by organisms that do not generate oxygen. They're anoxygenic phototrophs capable of oxidizing iron in a photosynthetically mediated process under environments where no oxygen is present whatsoever. And yet, these ferric minerals can form. Now scenario two, that is entirely different, is one where the organisms that ultimately catalyze the precipitation of these minerals were producers of molecular oxygen. And these are the cyanobacteria that you can see here that were critically important in the history of the evolution of metabolism and quite frankly also in changing the overall chemistry of the earth including its atmosphere because they evolved the ability, the remarkable ability to use water as an electron donor in photosynthesis, oxidize it to molecular oxygen and through this process power the reduction of CO2 to biomass. Now once they produce this oxygen the oxygen chemically would have been able to react with ferrous iron, oxidizing it to ferric iron, and then this in turn would go down the pathway to precipitate these rusty minerals I showed you. So here we have two options. One scenario where no oxygen in is involved, and the second scenario where oxygen is mandatory. And both of these are biological processes. So how do we distinguish between them if we're interested in understanding the types of organisms that were present on Earth in the remote past? Well, this is quite a challenge indeed, and 
there will be many years of investigations in the future in order to really pin this down. And it's a great field to get into if you're a beginning student interested in both biochemistry and evolution. But what I'll say just for now is that we know from a variety of indicators that somewhere between 2 billion and 3 billion years old, it is very probable, indeed it's almost certain, that the process of oxygenic photosynthesis arose. But when exactly this happened and how the evolutionary events came together such that these type of anoxygenic phototrophs that can utilize reduced substrates such as hydrogen or sulfur species or iron as electron donors in photosynthesis morphed into a more sophisticated type of phototroph that was capable of using water as an electron donor, the cyanobacteria, which in turn are what became the plastids, the chloroplasts, that we find in modern marine algae and also, of course, in plants that are very well known for their ability to do oxygenic photosynthesis. We do not know. We do not know when this happened. And in my third lecture in this series, I will discuss ways that we can begin to approach this problem. But it's a profound question, and what I'd like to leave you with now is just the simple message that these very ancient rocks, such as these banded iron formations here, are holding clues to a mystery that we have to unravel, and it's through tools of modern biology that ultimately we hope to get there.